We'd like to thank you for joining us for our session today, uh, Headcount Analysis 101. Uh, my name is Terry Kearns. I'm a senior account executive here at Revelwood. And uh, joining me today is Lee Lazaro. Lee uh, is a longtime planning analytics expert. Um, he runs our practice and he'll be taking us through the part of the presentation. So we'll touch on, I'll give you a quick overview on Revelwood. I know there's a lot of folks that are on the call today that have been to previous uh, sessions with us. So welcome back. And happily, we have some new folks as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about Revelwood. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our headcount model package and, and how we can help folks, uh, you know, deliver headcount planning in a very reasonable time frame. Um, and then Lee's going to talk a little bit more about what, what actually headcount analysis is, what it means, um, what in what creating a headcount model entails, what goes into that, uh, talk about a couple of customer examples and some things to consider. So a little bit about Revelwood. Um, we are um, a longtime um, IBM analytics business partner. In fact, we are a gold partner and we are the original IBM gold partner. Fun fact. So um, we've been at this for a long time. We've been helping finance uh, FP&A professionals uh, for over 25 years with um, the IBM planning analytics solution. Prior to that, it was TM1. Um, and we literally have hundreds of successful um, PA implementations worldwide. Um, we've got a team of excellent, really skilled, certified, experienced uh, PA consultants that uh, deliver these kinds of results for our customers. Um, we're very close with the IBM uh, company, with the IBM community. We've served on the North American Business Partner Council, uh, as well as the Planning Analytics Advisory Board. Um, so again, very, very close working relationship with IBM. Um, and one of the things I think you'll pick up in this presentation is that this is really about um, speaking business, speaking finance to finance professionals. That's where we tend to to lead and spend a lot of time. Um, so we speak business. Bu we speak business first. Our service offerings, um, as a longtime uh, IBM systems integrator, um, we do obviously full implementation services for new sales, um, upgrades, folks that are migrating to the cloud. Um, we have a lot of customers that are both in uh, on-prem and uh, in the cloud hybrid environments, so a real mix of different customer profiles. Um, we offer some different types of services for our customers, um, depending on what their situation is. So we offer a health check, which is really an assessment of what their, their overall situation is. We make recommendations. Um, Advantage services is a different way to package services. So we can uh, package up a, a, a number of uh, consulting days, and you, those can be used for uh, development or support or what have you. It's a very flexible uh, type of package. Um, some folks we serve as a help desk for, um, and then we offer system admin as a service uh, as well. So some folks are looking to outsource some of the administration of their system. Um, so again, variety of different types of offerings, very flexible, and then a full suite of training uh, at all different user levels uh, for planning analytics. Um, the headcount model package, um, we've delivered hundreds of um, headcount models, and you'll see in a minute, um, you know, a bit about our approach to, to doing that. Um, but, you know, as one of the most export, expensive costs for businesses today, people costs, um, we're always a little surprised that, that not more companies are really leveraging headcount planning uh, and, and all the important benefits that they can get from that. Um, so what's it take? In, in our case, we estimate it's at 10 days um, between the planning and definition of what the model looks like. Um, and then the actual build is the biggest part of that. It's five days. Um, from there, we deploy um, and integrate to source systems, You know, create test plans, UAT, and then finally, um, training and support. So 
we'll take you through those different pieces as we go through the presentation here. But we think that this is a, a very cost effective, very efficient way to um, have this capability and extend what you're currently doing in planning analytics to incorporate headcount uh, planning. Lee? All right. Well, thanks, Terry. Uh, so so let's, let's start the presentation by stating the obvious, that salary expenses are a massive portion of your company's costs. So I, I recently read an article that said labor costs could account for as much as 70% of your total business cost. Well, now that percentage isn't necessarily the norm, but we know that labor costs are typically the largest expense in your company. And I've seen a lot of definitions of rules of thumb that state anywhere from 15 to 30% of your gross sales should go towards your payroll costs. And, and based on those large numbers, we, we all know that Salary costs are important enough that within a standard chart of accounts, there's there's an entire focus on it. When we're looking at something like GAAP, we've got an entire set of numbers focused right on it. When we look at things like various cost accounting and manufacturing accounting, you know, the, the basic form of this defines three categories, and one of those three categories is labor. So labor is a huge portion. The, the salary components are a huge portion of your overall expenses. Okay, But the purpose of this presentation is not to conduct a deep dive analysis of the salary costs, but to instead discuss ways to analyze and plan for these costs. And this is where a headcount model comes into play. So what is a headcount model? A, a, a headcount model I look at as a summarized overview of your staff. Now, this is different than a true compensation model because a headcount model is designed to show the amount of people, not the amount of dollars. It, it's a much more compact data set there's far less information, and, and it's taking away a lot of the granularity. It, it's removing a lot of the different buckets associated with compensation dollars. So instead of looking at salary and taxes and fringe and all the various iterations of these items, we could simply just look at the number of, of heads. Okay? So the purpose of a headcount model is to better understand the resources in the organization. And this gives us the ability to quickly and easily analyze the data by time, employee type, and, and, and other simple groupings. Now, although I use the phrase simple groupings, the use of an OLAP tool, the use of planning analytics, gives us the ability to slice and dice the data in a lot of different ways. And this is where you have your opportunity. This is the opportunity for you to think about how do you want to categorize your employees? How do you want to analyze all your trends? And, and this is where you can make the determination of how do I slice and dice? So examples of this, maybe I want to do slicing and dicing by my company structure. This is where you look at the organizational segments by branch, by company, by department, by all the above. Okay. Maybe you want to think about things geographically. I want to look at it by state. I want to look at it by country, especially when, when we're thinking through some of the impacts of tax implications, visas, various other um, aspects of it. Country comes into play there too. Most importantly, almost every system that we build breaks it down by employee type. So this is where we look at full-time versus part-time, hourly versus salary, whether we, we put it in some kind of a bucket of administration or not administration, sales, non-sale, or even by specific position. All of these aspects are where the OLAP tool comes into play. All of these aspects are where we could do our slicing and dicing. And this is where the benefit of a headcount model will allow us to start breaking it down. So one of the reasons that you want to store these headcounts is for the analysis that we talked about. And we're going to continue to talk about. But the other reason is you can use the results of these headcount analyses for a lot of different statistics. This is where we're able to look at headcount versus FTE. How many people are physically in the building and how much are they working? Okay. This is where we also have the opportunity to start thinking about turnover, start thinking about churn. Okay. New employees within a specific time frame. If you're an organization that's growing right now, this is a great situation for us to start to see the trends, start to make sure that we're thinking through how are we growing? There's a lot of stories going on in the news right now of some of the tech companies who over the past five or so years, or maybe a little bit longer, just hired and hired and hired. And now they're in a situation where they're trying to cut expenses. And one of the first things that they're doing, getting rid of a lot of those people that they hired. Looking at some of those analytics, figuring out the pace of growth gives you the opportunity to think about, am I growing at a good pace? Am I growing you know, too fast? 
Okay. And we can also think of the exact opposite, thinking about the employees that left within a specific time frame. This starts to give us the ability to dig a little bit further into it. Why did they leave? Did we have some problem managers? Did we have some problem locations? Did we have some categories of problem people? Looking at these statistics starts to give us analytics. And, and if you've ever seen uh, some of my previous webinars, we talk about the difference between the what and the why. What? These are the statistics we were just talking about. Why? This is the opportunity for us to look further into it and see what's going on. Okay. But the biggest piece that people look at when they hear the word statistics is calculations. They look at the metrics. And if you think about it, a large portion of the metrics that you have are some kind of a per employee. They have per employee as the denominator. This is things as important as revenue and profit per employee. And this is where we could start looking at, start, start merging a lot of our dollars into the concept of the headcount. You know? And as you dig further into it, you can also expand that even further. Maybe we don't want to look at revenue per employee. Maybe we want to look at revenue per employee by type revenue per employee by full-time, part-time, revenue by employee by, and all of the different aspects of by, which again is where the OLAP system comes into play. So why not just build a full staff model? Why, why not just go you know, full Monty on it and say, let's take a look at the entire thing. And the main reason why that, or there, there's really two main reasons why we think of a headcount model separate than a full staff model. First thing, it's not as confidential as a true staff model. When you think about compensation, almost every implementation that we do, when we talk about security, when we talk about HIPAA laws, when we talk about, hey, I don't want my users to see X, Y, Z, almost always the topic starts with staff model. Why? Because salaries are really secure. Salaries are really secret. So by building a headcount model, and not thinking about dollars takes those aspects out. If I look at the fact that I have Johnny and Johnny makes $15,000 a year and Johnny has this particular uh, benefit plan and Johnny has, and I could continue to go on, there are so many different things that we have to filter and we have to block out that security sometimes becomes more complicated than the client initially wanted to start with. But if I don't reference Johnny, I say that there's one person who meets this criteria, none of that comes into play. So by building a headcount model takes away the complexity of security while still giving me the analytics of the, the kinds of aspects that I'm looking for. And, and I just use the phrase taking away, it's also taking away some of the granularity. It's also taking away some of the details, okay? By looking at Johnny and his salary and his benefit plan and all of these different things, evolves into a whole series of data analytics. How many people are on this plan? What kinds of dollars are coming into play? Hey, if I know salary, let me calculate out taxes and fringes, pieces like that, okay? If you think about it, even within your financial buckets, you don't just have a salary account, a tax account, a fringe, a fringe account, okay? There are a ridiculous amount of GL accounts within the, these groups, okay? And there's likely a lot of logic used to calculate these intricacies. Determining when is a person eligible for benefits, figuring out thresholds for taxes. And based on this, with all of the granularity that comes into play, it's really easy to lose focus of what you're trying to solve. It's really easy to lose focus on the main goal of a headcount model. And that's simply to figure out how many employees do I have? Okay. So when you think about a headcount model, you don't necessarily have to say, let me start fresh, okay? A headcount model doesn't have to be a new database. It's really easy to plug this into your existing model because you already have a lot of the pieces in place. You spent a lot of effort creating your elements, maintaining your structures. You continue to maintain your dimensions. So why, why start all over again, okay? By adding on a headcount into your model gives you the opportunity to use what you have but it also gives you the opportunity to use these results in your existing model because headcount, like we said before, is an important part of your metric calculations. It's the denominator for so many of your metrics that knowing that your numerators are already in the system, popping in a denominator gives us the opportunity to say, let me use what's already there 
and let me continue forward with it. This is where we could start to look into revenue per employee, profit per employee, sales per salesperson, projects per manager. Okay. Most of these numbers, when we look at it, are dollars, revenue, profit, sales. Okay. But you're not limited to the dollars. This gives us the ability to do metrics upon metrics, stats upon stats, projects. Okay. This is also where we have the ability to, as I referenced earlier, say, I simply want to look at employee. Revenue per employee, profit per employee. But maybe I want to get a little bit more granular. Maybe I want to also look at employee type, sales per salesperson. Well, that's not an employee. It's a type of employee, projects per manager. And this is where we have the opportunity to think about what are the metrics that I want to calculate and how do I figure out that denominator? And that's your headcount. So, so now that we understand the concepts, of a headcount model and, and some of the reasons why we want to do it. What I want to discuss is I want to discuss some customer examples. Okay? So I'm going to go through three examples, three concepts that we have for customers. First example, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about using your existing core financial cube, how we're able to load headcount metrics into something that already exists, a GL-based financial cube. Okay? The second example we're going to talk about, we're still going to load metrics. And what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how we loaded metrics into a brand new cube. And this cube gives us the ability to look at things by employee. And the third approach says, hey, you know what? Let's go full granular. We already have an existing staff model. We have the dollars. We have the fringe and the taxes and all those kinds of things. Let's just add something in. So I'm going to show you all three of those examples. Our first example. Our first example is loading into an existing financial cube. Okay. Now, for disclosure reasons, I, I can't show an actual client's model. I previously talked about the security. I previously talked about the aspects. There's kind of no way that I would be able to actually show a model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what this company did, and I'm going to show you a screenshot of a sample database with an example of the dashboard. Okay. So using the existing financial queue, you know, many people call it finance. Some people call it BPM finance core, whatever we choose to call it. We already have a cube in play. That cube already has a dimension associated with your chart of accounts. Okay? So what the customer did in this case is the customer simply just added a new stat account. Okay? Some customers already have statistical accounts defined in the chart of accounts. Some people need to create it. For those who have it, you might it, it probably begins with a nine so that they're, ended, that they're at the end of the list. Maybe they actually have an entire section called stats or they have something where they're using words. But what this customer did is they actually created a brand new consolidation. They called it stats and they added specific metric accounts in there. And that way they're able to look at the headcounts. Okay. Based on that, we then needed to load the data. So what we did is we created a brand new load script. Now, the reason we created a brand new load script it was done through a separate load due to the location of the source data. Okay, If the data, the GL data and the metrics data was all in the same source table, it would have been easy just to add another field into the existing load, tweak the existing TI script, quick hit, you know, boom, we're done. But in this particular case, the GL data was separated from the, fine, from the uh, headcount data based on finance HR, and we simply just created a new script so that we could populate some of these metrics. Okay. But the biggest thing that came into play is we use their existing structure. Okay. By using their existing structure, it was real easy to plug it in. From a development standpoint, it was simply add a new stat account. Okay. But the piece that comes into play, and again, for those of you who've seen some of my uh, pr presentations in the past, you know that I'm a big fan of promoting user experience, UX, okay? By using that existing structure made it a real easy user experience for everybody because we were able to use existing reports. All we had to do is add a couple of lines to it. We were able to pop some new calculations into it because the, the values that we're looking at, the numerators were already in the cube. It made it real easy for our end users to define how do I look at it? And by the way, what am I looking at? But more importantly, it was easy for the users to access the data. They already knew their core model. They already knew the dimensions. They already knew the ability and, and the ways to, to navigate through it. 
There was no new security that was needed. There was no new training that was needed. There was no new implementation that was needed. So it was real easy for the users to simply just say, hey, here's this cool new piece. Let me start analyzing it. Whether we're talking about pre-structured reports where we simply added a line or whether we're talking about new reports and new ad hoc analysis, there was no user training. Okay. So based on that concept of pre-structured reports, the dashboard on the right is an example of the, the kinds of pieces that we showed to the customer. Okay. And the approach is real simple. Values on the left, charts on the right. Okay. So over on the left, over on the left, we used our typical Revelwood standard for consistency purposes, titles, picks, selectors, whatever phrase you use. Top left corner, it's the very first thing that you see. Okay. Then from there on the left, we were able to just simply have a list. Here's the time frame. Here's the value that we show. Again, really no training involved. It's pretty obvious that here's the amount of headcount in January 2018. Here's the amount of headcount in February, March, et cetera. Okay. But then over on the right, we've got those charts. Okay. So what we did is we created a couple of line charts. One line chart shows data, one line chart shows a calculated metric. Okay. So from the data standpoint, it's real easy for me to visualize those numbers on the left. It's real easy for me to see the trend. Hey, it looks like everything is going up from February all the way to seven, September. Something happened in September where a whole bunch of people left. A, I see a trend. B, I ask myself a question. And this is where we start the analytics. This is where we start the thinking. Okay. But what we also wanted to do is in addition to simply just saying, show me the results, I also want to do some of those analytics that we talked about. Something per something. Dollars on the top, revenue. Headcount on the top per employee. And this is where we start to see a little bit more trending. Okay. This is a pretty simple line chart for purposes of, of this example. But if I wanted to merge some more financial data into this, we, we absolutely could have made the middle chart into a line and column chart. That way it gives us the ability to show a line in the columns. We, we could start correlating our revenue dollars associated with the revenue per employee, and we could start looking at multiple metrics at the same time. Okay. But the other piece that comes into play is that top chart, that top line shows us the trend, but it doesn't necessarily show us numbers that really jump out unless I'm looking closely at it. And that's where the waterfall chart at the bottom right corner appears. That waterfall chart gives us the ability to quickly look at the greens and the reds. When I did my example up on the top with the head count, I said, eh, from February up to September, everything looks like it's growing. But then as soon as I have that waterfall chart, we look at it, we say in June, it actually shrunk a little bit. No, it only shrunk a little bit, but the purpose of the line chart is to show us the trend, whereas the purpose of the waterfall chart is to actually have things jump out at us. And the goal of each one of these charts is to give us a series of data points that all correlate together. And the way that we wanted to talk about the, those two pieces, a series of data parts, data points correlate together. A series of data points. What we did is we put a title on each one of those charts. Tell the users what they're looking at. Okay, Correlate together. When you look at the structure of this, each of the charts purposely repeats the time period. It avoids having the users shift their head up and down to see what's going on. We made sure that they were symmetrical. As I look at September in the top, I see the exact same spot with September at the bottom. It makes it real easy for me to do two things. Number one, I give this to my users and they know exactly what it is. There's grids, there's words. It's very straightforward of what's on there. And thing number two, it correlates together. The whole purpose of a chart is to tell a story. The whole purpose of charts, plural, is to put the pieces together. And this is where we start answering some of those metrics and some of those questions about the why. So this is an example of what we did for a customer who was loading it into their existing financial cube. Okay. The next one. The next one is an example of a customer who created a brand new headcount cube. And again, th this is a screenshot of an actual customer with actual details. Now, again, for, for disclosure purposes, I had to block some of the things out and I purposely kept some of the titles and took them off. But what you're gonna see is creating a new headcount cube really came up to a couple of parts, okay? Part number one, we created some new dimensions. So we started with the existing dimensions from the finance model, their locations, they call them branches, the time, things like that. 
when we looked at the previous example, we said we started with the existing cube, and that way we could just plug in. In this particular case, we already had the cube, but to build a new cube, again, we didn't want to start fully from scratch, so we used our existing dimensions. You know, power of TM1, the power of planning analytics. Maintain once, use many. Now, if a brand new branch gets added in this particular customer, it gets added in the finance model. It also gets added into the staff model, or, the, or should, sorry, the headcount model, I'll call it. When we add a new year, when we add new time, when we add new components to the shared dimensions, it gets added through the entire system. Okay. But what we did is we then added some brand new dimensions to allow them to define their employees. In this particular case, we did it by type, and there were two different categories of type. Okay. First type, pay rate type. Okay. This is where we broke it down to hourly and salary employed. Okay. And in most of our customers, hourly and salary are the two, two, the two main components. But for this particular customer, they were in the process of creating their database. They were creating their external warehouse. And they knew that they had some potential issues where employees might not be properly classified. And in some cases, not classified at all. So what we did is we created a third bucket called no pay rate. So when the data source came in, if it said hourly, we loaded to hourly. If it said salary, we loaded to salary. If it said anything else or even blank, we loaded into no pay rate. And this gave them the ability to work with their IT team to help them build their data warehouse. As they were doing their reconciliation, as they're doing their analytics, if they see anybody listed at no pay rate, they could go back and look at their source data, say, hey, let me do a cleanup and let me do a reload. So in essence, it was almost like an audit trail, but instead of an audit trail on the finance side, we built no pay rate as an audit trail on the technical side. Okay. And we also gave them the ability to do a secondary type. In addition to hourly salary, we wanted to break down how are they in the field? Are they direct or are they indirect? If they're direct, they're out in the field. If they're indirect, where are they? Are they on the sales team? Are they in the office? Okay. And by having these buckets allowed us to start doing slicing and dicing. Now, in this particular case, what we also did is we created a dimension for employee ID. Okay? They used an internal ID number to alleviate any concerns about actual recognition. All the stuff we talked about earlier, security, HIPAA violations, et cetera. So they had their own internal number, which not only took away that concern, but gave us the ability to populate attributes. It gave us the ability to include text information at the leaf level, such as job description or other kinds of, of pieces that they may want to filter on in the future or they may want to categorize. And as we continue to expand through the PA environment, it allows us to create things such as virtual hierarchies. We're going to be able to utilize the employee ID where I could say, I want to create a roll-up structure that shows me all of the XYZ descriptions versus all of the ABC descriptions. And the second thing we did then is we built a series of measures. Okay. So as we look at this image, we could see here's my dimensionality. I've got my branches. I've got my types. I've got my employees. But then as I go left and right, first two, headcount FTE. We were able to populate and analyze the difference between employees and hours. Headcount, are they physically in the seat? You could see that for office, there are three physical people there during this particular time period. FTE how much of their week, in their case, the 40 hour week, how much of their 40 hour week are they there? They're there for two and a half, the equivalent of two and a half people. It starts to give us the analytics. And instead of saying, I wanna look at headcount or FTE, they change that word to and. We're looking at headcount and FTE. Now, what they also wanted to do is they also wanted to calculate employee changes. So instead of just looking at it, on the chart like we had before, they wanted to be able to look at actual metrics. They wanted to be able to figure out how many new employees were there and how many employees had left. And those are the next two measures. Okay. New and term counts. This, this started to help them for their churn analysis. It also helped them reconcile their numbers. I am able to look at this and say, last month I had 10 employees. This month I have nine employees and I see that my new employee count was one and my term employee count was two. I know that's not what's on the screen, but just making it up so the math would work. This gave me the opportunity to reconcile the numbers to say, hey, going back to my data warehouse, I'm still making sure everything's legit. One way to make sure it's legit is to make sure that the math works. And this gives us the ability to look at the counts. New employee count. When you look at the new employee count, you're going to see that they have a headcount and an FTE. 
When you look at the term employee account, you're going to see that when we go back to headcount and FTE, that's set up at zero. That way they have a whole series of analytics that we could do. And the final piece of analytics, which is, is a pretty cool one, this customer wanted to know tenure. They wanted to know tenure in months. How long has each person been employed? And this gave us the ability to answer some of those questions we were talking about before about the why. You know, how long has someone been there? Well, when we look at that first bucket, the office, we could see that there's an average tenure. I could look at each person and see the tenure, but more importantly, I want to look at average tenure of that group. That average tenure has been there about 77 months. You know, let's just round that to six and a half years. Six and a half years shows that there's a pretty experienced staff in there. Whereas when I look at the sales team, that sales team has been there for 24 months, much newer. Okay. This starts to give us the answers to some of those whys. When we're looking at the revenue per employee, when we're looking at some of the X per employees, do we see a difference between the experience, the people with the longer tenure versus the newer? Do we see some kind of a better or worse based on that? Is there some kind of a trend that we can look at? And once we see those patterns, it's going to help us for hiring. It's going to help us for consolidation. It's going to help us for training. It's going to help us with a lot of analytics by just by looking at these six sets of numbers. There is an abundance of paths that we can go down to analyze and more importantly, improve the business just by looking at headcounts. The third example that I want to show is an add-on to an existing staff model. Okay. So when we do an add-on to an existing staff model, just like with the core financial model, we use the exact we use the existing model. In the staff model, we did the exact same thing. Just like before, we used the existing cubes, the existing dimensions, users already knew it, everything was already built, you know, et cetera. And what we did is before in the core model, we added some new accounts. In the staff model, we added some new accounts. In this particular case, we call them measures. Okay? But the cool thing about adding it to an existing staff model, when we were in the finance model, it's brand new. I needed to load the data. When we are in the staff model, most, if not all of the data that we needed is already there. And based on that, we were able to calculate out full-time headcount, part-time headcount as rules instead of TI. Because they were rules, we used the existing data. We didn't have to create we, we didn't have to create any new TI scripts. We didn't have to go talk to IT or HR about getting new data feeds. We didn't have to do anything outside of the finance team because everything was already there. There was already the data and the detailed analyses were already in place. This allowed us to do a little bit for a little bit more detailed slicing and dicing because multiple dimensions were already in place. Company, department, year, scenarios, all those kinds of things, okay? And what it also allows us to do in this particular case, it allows us to merge these examples together because by adding something to the staff model, we already had the staff model flowing into the core finance model from a dollar standpoint, okay? It allowed us to use the same approach because we could use the same logic that was already in place. It allowed us to take those headcount numbers, the, the statistical numbers that we calculated into the system and have that flow to finance in a consolidated manner. So this approach in, in theory actually merged one and three together. Instead of loading something directly into finance, we built something into staff and rule-based that into finance. And, and to expand upon that further, this approach also allows us to use the built-in drill-through functionality. We can go to a summarized finance value. We can then drill down, come back to a report like this, and this gives users the ability to easily see totals, but then they can also drill down into the specific details. So those are three different examples of real implementations that we've done. Okay. And what I often like to do is I like to say, great, now that we've shown you what are the options to, to do it, I like to, to say, what are the things that we want to think about when we're doing it? And I believe that there's three different things to consider when we're doing our headcount modeling. Okay. First part, who do you, who to include? Okay. Who do you want? What do you want to be part of your model? Do you want your model to include everyone or just full-time employees? 
for example, do you want to include contractors in the analysis or do you want to include just the company's employees? Do you want to include part-time employees or do you want to include full-timers? We have built models where we include and exclude. Maybe we're going to include full-time employees and we're going to exclude contractors and we do contractors on the GL level. We have built models where we say, I only want to include full-time in a full staff detail, but then I'll take part-time and do it as a headcount model. Gives us the ability to either include, exclude, or build separate models for separate purposes. Okay, And this also gives us the ability to think about what is that definition where we say active employees. For example, is a person on leave considered to, to be within this model? And if they are included, do you want to consider them as employed during their leave time? This, this concept makes the determination of what information do I pull in. If someone on leave is not included, great. We just skip it on the data loader. We don't even include it. If somebody on leave is included, but they're not included during their time, maybe we want to have another measure. Maybe we want to have another calculation. Maybe we want to have some extra analytics. Okay. It always comes back to the same thing. What's the business problem that we're trying to solve. And once we define the business problem, once we define the question that we want to ask, planning analytics is used to, to answer that question. Second thing we want to think about, how do we design it? So we just saw as part of our examples that there's three different approaches that we can use for the headcount model. Okay? One approach is to store the information in a staff model. Okay? This is going to give you a lot more information than a simple, are they there approach? But the results of these details still allow you to consolidate those headcounts. Okay. Second approach, you still we, we can have a model that still analyzes details by person, but doesn't have all the calculations or the details that a full model. This is still going to include a dimension for each employee, but the measures dimension, the processing, it's going to be much, much more simplified. Okay. You'll still be able to assess the totals of regions and groups, and you'll still be able to dig further to look at specific employees. But it allows for a detailed analysis of your data while limiting much of the security concerns associated with dollars. Okay. And the third approach is to simply store the totals. So, so actually, if you think about it, the three that I just listed are in reverse of what I had shown. Okay. That third approach is to simply store the totals, which is what we did in the finance model, the core financial. You know, in that example, for example, we could see that 10 people were in the finance department's east region, but we wouldn't know the specific people. That information can be stored in the headcount model, but by putting it directly into the finance model gives us the ability to simply have a value. Okay? And the results of all this helps us plan. This helps us plan to either increase or minimize future churn. It helps us with our hiring. It helps us with our reorganization. If you're looking to do a reorg or you're looking to conduct some layoffs, a headcount model can help you plan for these cost savings. By using an average cost for the, the headcounts for the data in your model, combined with a general fringe rate, you can easily and quickly determine the total reduction in compensation expenses based on a change. If you're looking to minimize churn, you can start analyzing patterns. Where are people leaving? When are they leaving? Maybe you know that there's a, a certain time of year that you're pretty seasonal. You're going to be able to see the pattern. Maybe you're going to see that there's an area where there's a new manager, or maybe there's a new set of employees and an experienced manager. These kinds of patterns are going to help you determine when and why people are leaving. And this could save your organization a lot of money due to a, a, a reduction of recruiting and training. And th there's a lot of statistics out there about how much it costs to bring on a new employee. But the main takeaway is that it costs a lot more to hire someone brand new than it does to retain the existence. Okay. So based on all of this, uh, that what, what we've just shown is we, we talked a little bit about what is a headcount model used for. We went through three specific examples of how we could build it. And then we talked about some things to consider regarding the design of it. Okay. So now I'm going to turn this back over to Terry to uh, help wrap things up. Thanks, Lee. So as you can see from, from Lee's presentation, we've got a lot of experience building headcount models, and that's how we arrived at this package, um, which is a 10-day package for uh, the complete um, build and completion of, of the model. It's a time and materials estimate, so your mileage may vary, but um, we think that for the vast majority of our customers, it's a, it's a good estimate. Um, but we're happy to jump on a call with you, talk more about your specific situation, your environment, 
Um, and we can give you a very accurate estimate of what that looks like, but we think this is a pretty good head start. Next slide. In, in addition to that, um, we offer and would love you to take us up on uh, a, a, a free 30 minute call uh, with myself and Lee to talk about whether it's the headcount planning model, whether it's some other issue and your, your planning analytics environment, uh, if you just have questions you'd like answered, or you know if you wanna pick our brains about possible new projects, a health check, um, or any other needs you may have, please reach out to me, let me know. Uh, I'll set that up with Lee. And uh, again, please let us figure out and let us know how we can help you. So we wanna thank you for attending the session today. We really appreciate it. Again, we'd love to have a follow-up discussion um, with you to you know, chat about you know, opportunities, whether it's headcount or others. Um, but if you um, have questions in the meantime, please let me know, reach out, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thanks very much for your time, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.